We are going to be looking at uh, Acts chapter 28, the first 30 verses, which is uh, all 30 verses, I should say. And uh, we're looking at the unsinkable. And uh, we have a theme this morning, and our theme is this. It says that an unthinkable spirit dares to believe that what God says can and will be accomplished in and through us. In and through us. Many years ago, I remember going to a church service and watching a, uh, it was a movie on the life of Johnny Erickson Tata. And I think I was probably around age 10. And I hadn't seen such gruesome things like that in, in a cinema in my life. And yes, I understand it's real life. But at 10 year old, it kind of scared me a little bit. So if you don't know the life of Johnny Erickson Tata, I have a picture up here so you can see what she looks like uh, to this day. Johnny Erickson Tata in 1967 dove into the Chesapeake Bay into shallow end and broke her spine. And she lost the touch of her body forever. The story of her battle in life and, and even greater the story of her soul is so very well known today. But the story of her, of her battle really shows us an incredible, unsinkable spirit to this day in modern day times. If you listen to her speak or sing or captivate an audience, you're seeing someone who serves Christ through an unbelievable lens and with an incredible image of what Christ's strength looks like today. You see, the secret to an unsinkable spirit is taught in many passages all throughout Scripture, including Acts chapter 28, where the Apostle Paul specifically is, is one from the time he met Christ on the road to Damascus. We see one who has is, is been completely changed. His life has been filled with the bravery of Jesus. So when he walked the course of this life, you see a man who's walking with bravery because he knew what he was doing. He was doing it for Jesus. And we've, as we walk through the entire book of Acts together, we've seen how he served the Lord as he ministered on these missionary journeys, as he was willing to uh, not hold anything back, as he stood in front of sorcerers, as he was stoned, as he was drugged out of the city of Lystra dead. After being beaten in Philippi, he and Silas had gone to share the gospel in Europe for the very first time. And he understood the, the heavy and withstood the heavy intellectuals in Athens and was able to, to wear the hat of, of such strong understanding with his past of being a Pharisee. So we see a life of someone who is dealing with the corruption of Corinth and the violence in Ephesus and, and brought about to the front line of Jerusalem and Caesarea as he's come before the kings and the kinsmen there. He inspired many with his courage during the storm as he was shipwrecked in our last chapter. But as we walk into chapter 28, the final chapter of what a church looks like on fire is someone that lives a life like Paul. And it's important to understand it. As we see this and understand is, is he's coming on to shore here, which is now present day St. Paul's Bay, which is a tiny island of Malta. We see an unsinkable spirit prevail as he's coming into this dealing with the, the beginning of the chapter. It talks about he dealt with a snake bite. Yeah, we're skipping over that because I know how some of you are fair, afraid of snakes, including myself. Anyway, but he also continues in dealing with the healing of one of the governor's father and, and in continuing in his ministry. Three months later, we finally get to where Paul is, is left more. He actually leaves more of a, an honored prisoner than what we would ever imagine anyone to ever be. But he most certainly was an honored prisoner in the eyes of God. Again, we often, we, we equate a man who, after God's own heart, is, is King David, right? According to Scripture, that's, that's true. But one of the unsung, I wouldn't say unsung here, but one of the greatest Christians who ever walked the face of this earth is the Apostle Paul. 
And when we look at scriptures, we've walked through the book of Acts, we've walked through a lot of his life. And we see in verses 11 through 16, it describes this journey on the way to Rome as they sailed from Malta in another grain ship. I don't know why they chose another grain ship. We learned last time that they sink very easily if there's a storm, right? But they stopped at, uh, in Syracuse, right outside in Sicily. And as they are at the base of Italy there, which is now modern-day Naples, they walked 140 miles to Rome. Man, you talk about a man with a purpose, a man with vision and a desire to share in Rome. He was on his way, and, and outside there's a group of Christian brothers and sisters that came out to greet him at a market. And with them comes this giant group of people from a long distance, and they came to see him enter the city. Now, it's important that we understand his circumstances because it builds this unsinkable spirit as far out as it goes. Why? Luke writes, and it's important for us to understand the excitement and optimism at this time is, look in verse 16. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. So the definition of an unsinkable spirit is one who is literally connected to a guard via chain and happy about it. Happy about it. What comes about with such a secret, with this, the secret of such a spirit? Well, we're going to be spending a majority of our time in verses 16 to 24. And we see the secrets of that. The first one we see is the secret of vision. Again, looking at the Apostle Paul, when you see a person with that type of vision, that type of drive, you see someone who is very, very driven. And driven with this type of vision. Paul was a man with incredible spiritual vision. His conversion of his own people and the evangelism of the entire world started with him. It started with Paul. And so concerning his own people, you'll see here in Romans chapter 9 verse 3, it says this, For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race. Did you gather that? He's saying he'd rather be cut off than not, than not have them know about it. Do, do we have that type of desire? Like I'd rather, I'd give my own life if, if my people knew about Jesus. What then he goes on concerning the Gentiles in Romans chapter 15, verse 20. It has, been, it has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where, this, where Christ was not known. So that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. You see, he longed to see the Jews and Gentiles as one body under the cross of Christ. That was his desire. Okay, so if we're going into the overarching theme of what the book of Acts is, is what the church on fire looks like, if this is the, the culmination of all of that together, where is Paul's heart? Evangelism. The church on fire evangelizes. The church on fire doesn't come and sit in a church and sit in a pew and just sit. And just listen and go home and be different. That's nice, but that's not the vision that Paul had. Paul desired Jews and Gentiles alike who did not know Jesus to know Jesus and to do everything in his power, even if it cost him his own life, that they would know Christ as he knew Christ. You see, a man with this type of vision is, is this broad vision for the entire world. That's why missions is so vital and so important. It's so important to understand that whether it's the fixed and focused vision in what's going on in our church, absolutely. But there's things that are happening outside of our church that are just within our, our financial reach that we can be a part of. That's what God's called us to do. 
Maybe perhaps it's, it's to, to work with the youth ministry or the children's ministry. Maybe it perhaps it's, it's going into a medical center in a third world country and working there. I can tell you what it's not. It's not sitting in our houses and just sitting. It's participating in the work that God's given us to do. It's to be visible. See, the battle of the church today is that we often aren't looking at it through any out of peripherals. We're looking at the world just of what we can see or maybe what we can thumb through and scroll. It's important that we ask God for His vision. Because a church on fire asks God for His vision. God, help me to see others the way you see others. Help me be the light of Christ to those who do not know. Whatever it takes, I want to be a part of this. See, Paul knew this call and had one of the clearest visions of Christ that any man had ever known. Colossians chapter 3. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Because he himself did this, God gave him this expanded vision of life to the entire world, which led to an unsinkable spirit. Without the, such a vision, we would never come anywhere close to Paul's spiritual perseverance. Again, you talk about perseverance. The Apostle Paul walked through things with perseverance. He's attached to a Roman guard via chains, and he's optimistic. <laughs> Only God can give that, I promise you. Do we have that type of vision for our friends? Do we have specific vision for our friends? For relationships? Do we have specific vision for small group or for our families, for our prayer lives? If so, that's the ingredient that comes with an unsinkable spirit. It's the vision that God gives. Secondly is this. The second secret is faith. Faith. Again, going back, the church on fire starts with vision, goes with faith. What? What's the faith? It's the believing. It's the belief aspect of it. There was a, an American prisoner during the Vietnam War that was led to believe that if he cooperated with his captors, that he would be set free. And he had done everything that he could do in, in to, while being in captive for two years. See, he had the vision in front of him that became a leader in the, in the prison with this reform group that had taken place. But unfortunately, the day that the vision had passed where he realized that he would not be set free... He desired to curl up in his bunk and refused to eat and was dead a few days later. You see, when we don't have that vision or that faith in believing with what's to come, then our hope is gone. We have no hope. The faith that believing that what Paul believed and had this type of faith is what is acquired with being a part of having an unsinkable spirit. You see, Paul's faith was not derailed by his ministry. Paul did not turn out as, as he was looking to see what he had envisioned. He had envisioned, oh, I'm going to go back to Rome. I'm going to share with all these different people. It's going to be amazing. There's going to be large groups of people that are going to gather. Tons of people are going to give their lives to the Lord. This is going to be great. But that's not actually what happened. See, when the time came, he was confined to a single dwelling in prison, chained to a soldier. Yet he had faith that God would still use his life. See, God does not always conform to our neat understandings or pre-suspicions or, or conceptions of what's going to happen. He always and gives us this essence of, of what he wants for us. Because we can know this. This is one thing I can promise you is always true. God's way is always better. God's way is always better, and God knows what He's doing. Because we might think and look at our circumstances like, how can I even take a step right now because of what's going on in front of me? God knows what He's doing. And His plan is always better than what we want. 
1 Thessalonians 5, chapter 24 says this, The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Have faith that he is at work in and through us. The third secret is this, is a willingness to fight. Now, some of us might be like, that's right. That's right. I cannot wait for this type of service. The pastor just told me I'm allowed to fight. Calm your tail down, okay? Easy, easy. Now, the concept, it, might, it seems a little foreign to me. I'm not a fighter. I'm not. I love people, right? I have a tendency to even be a little bit of a pacifist. But when you look at this from the lens of Paul, my perspective has changed. Because when Paul is in the middle of this apartment in house arrest, chained to a soldier, do you know what he's doing? He's defending himself. I'm not talking about physically, people. <laughs> he's not yanking the soldier, beating him against the wall, like, get, let go of me, no. Each one of these soldiers had questions. They wanted to know why he is. Again, as we've established the past couple of weeks, as every time he steps into one of these Roman kinsmen and they continue to bombard him and say, no, you need to stay captured. Why? They're like, why? What did I do? Well, we don't know, but you need to be captured. The Roman soldiers are wondering the very same thing. Why are you, why am I attached to you? Why are you so dangerous? What's going on with your life that, that, that's allowing you to just stay connected to me? What's so interesting is, is they're on rotation of what's taking place. Like, hey, my, my eight-hour shift's over. You're, you know, you're connected to me for the next eight hours. What's Paul doing? What does Paul have? A captivated audience. Guess what he's doing? He's willing to fight for what he knows. He's willing to fight for the cause of Christ. That's what he's fighting for. That's what he's fighting for. He's, he's taking on these, these Jewish leaders as they're gathering together and have these defense. Now, this, what's interesting is, just look at it in verse 17. I love what it's 17 to 20 right here. These days later, he called together the Jewish leaders. Okay, so a guy who's a prisoner, what's he doing? He's calling the leaders. Come here, I want to talk to you. And what do they do? They come. Amazing. When they assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people and against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to, to release me, but I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. The Jews objected. So I was compelled to have to make an appeal to Caesar. I certainly did not intend to bring any charge against my own people. For this reason, I have asked to see you and talk to you, talk with you. It's because the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. Pause right there. Did you just see what he just said? The reason and why I'm happy to be here is the hope of Israel, who is Jesus. That's my hope. My hope is Christ. I need nothing else. Surprisingly, they responded mildly to him. Verse 21, they responded, We have not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and none of our people who have come from there has reported or said anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are. For we know that people everywhere are talking about this sect. Oh, interesting word used there at the very end. We'll talk about that in just a second. But their claim was to know nothing about Paul. And, and they're saying, I don't know anything. In fact, anything bad, that's, uh, nothing's ever been said bad about you. You see, see, Christianity had been known to the Jews for years. 
and has subjected this division and come over to the city of Rome. So the truth is that the Jews knew exactly with what Paul was saying when they're like, well, we don't know a whole lot about what you're saying. That's not true. They knew exactly what he was saying. They just didn't have any proof why he was in captivity. They had no reason. He had done nothing wrong. But they use a real interesting word there at the very end. Their, their true feelings came through in calling Christianity a sect. Okay, so that's interesting. The translation that comes from the Greek word of heresy. So what do they equate Christianity with? Heresy. So if they don't know what it is, why are they calling it heresy? Interesting, right? Interesting perspective. See, Paul got what he had wanted, and he had agreed, they had agreed to meet with him, and next meeting, Paul was literally going to fight with him. He said, all right, let's go, leaders. Come on, I want to talk to you. I want you to hear with what I have to say, and, and uh, I, I've been desiring this for a long time. Okay? Verse 23. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and come in even and came in even large numbers to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God and from the law of Moses and from the prophets. He tried to persuade them about Jesus. Some were convinced about what he said, but others would not believe. Okay, what just took place there? He invited everyone, to, all the leaders to come. Well, what comes on with all the leaders? A huge gathering in this little house where Paul is on house arrest. So it's like the largest home study in history. It's, uh, they're all bombarded in and, and filled in, and he takes about 12 hours to explain the truth. He's like, I got a captive audience. I'm going to use this. I'm going to go all the way here. We're going to see what this has to say. So what does he do? He goes through and certainly has a time where he's sharing the gospel and gave an argument with a detailed extreme of, of what had become extremely logical to their understanding. And he brought it to their understanding. He's not saying, hey, you need to understand this, this language that I know. No, he shared it with what they might know. So what does he have an understanding of? Probably their culture. He understand with what their views were. He didn't just say, hey, I'm just going to study this. I'm only going to know this. He's, he understood the social part of it. He understood the culture part of it. Many historians believe that it was about a 12 hours of serious discussion. But see, Paul was fighting for the cause of Christ. How was he fighting? So this is, takes you where all of you are like this. Yes, I can't wait to fight. He's fighting with his mind. He's sharp. He's studying. We just started a Sunday school class on apologetics. You want to know about what we study and the importance of understanding the reason to what we believe? Come to that class. We're understanding the intellectual part of it. We're understanding what Scripture has to say. And some of the people were persuaded and some weren't. But regardless of how Paul presented it, he understood this. I heard, it once, I heard it once said that the same fire that melts wax also hardens clay. So the very fact of, that the goal of what Paul was sharing, he was sharing God's words to them, and some believed and some didn't. So here's the thing about when we're sharing our faith, we need to understand that some might believe and some might not. But that doesn't go because I don't think that they're going to believe I'm not going to share with them. That has nothing to do with it. Our job is just to share. And the church on fire shares. Paul uses his limitations to, to make sure that God is known here. So as he's chained to all these different soldiers, one commentary put it beautifully. It said that Paul's room became a fulcrum from which the world moved understanding, the spiritual understanding came from Paul and he started it all. He moved it. And everything else that, that geared up and moved accordingly afterwards started with him. Why? Because he was attached to a soldier and he always had an audience. Always. How did he do it? Philippians chapter 1 verses 12 and 13 put it beautifully. 
Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. You see, the shift of guard gave them a different understanding. He had a captive audience. In this first, some of the guards were probably wondering, what in the world's going on here? But eventually, they would see the reality of his life as saying, okay, this guy is actually, it, it actually makes sense what he's saying. And, and the, his, the history with what just took place with Christ being here on earth, we actually know about that stuff. So... This actually sounds legit. Like, I remember hearing about a crucifixion of a Jew, why they brought him to be crucified. Like, I remember hearing that. You see these Roman soldiers, things are moving in their minds. They're starting to understand this. And soon the guards were trading places in duty time because they wanted to meet with Paul. See, today in Rome, there's actually a, a square of plaster that's cut in a wall in the barracks in what is the palace of Caesar in, in Italy right now. And there's, uh, there's, a scratched, uh, there's this scratched figure of a, of a donkey's head and nailed it to a cross that is a, a person that is a, per a person who's pictured kneeling before it. And the artwork is obviously it's an insult to a Roman soldier that's being taken place who converted to Christianity during the time he was with Paul. So there's literal factual things of this taking place in it. And it said under, it said a person's name, uh, which is Anaximus, worships his God. And so they're making fun of him because they're putting a donkey's head on him and saying, yeah, he's worshiping this, this guy on the cross. But the picture of what we're trying to share with you is that these Roman elite came to know Christ during this time. And, and as he led some of them to become privileged friends to who Jesus was. Philippians 4 verse 22 says this, All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. You see, we'll see instances throughout Philippians as Paul is writing this uh, of what has taken place. You see, according to the last verse in the book of Acts, Paul witnessed to all his visitors with boldness and without hindrance, it says. And we need to understand that while he was a prisoner through the Holy Spirit, he wrote the New Testament books of Philippians, Philemon, Ephesians, Colossians, and 2 Timothy while he was captive in Rome. You see, even in the midst of, and, and I want us to understand, those books I just mentioned are, are known as the most Christological books of all the writings um, throughout Scripture. It means it, it explains Christ the best. And it's understanding that as, as Paul is doing this, great things are happening even in the difficult years, despite his own personal and circumstantial limitations, as, as Paul was going out and getting ready to be killed for Christ. He wrote this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. For which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Beautiful. Beautiful. You see, if we look to the, the, the fullest extent of through the book of Acts, we'll see at the very beginning. Do you guys remember the very beginning of chapter 1, verse 8? It says to go. Do you guys remember? To go to Samaria and to the ends of the earth, right? To share the gospel. It's one of Jesus' last words that he shared before he ascended into heaven. And what takes place at the very end of the book of Acts? A man who did exactly with what Jesus said. Yeah, we've taken about a year to walk through the book of Acts, but if you've been here and be a part of it, you've seen this culmination of taking place of what happened when the church was set into motion when Jesus ascended, right? The church set into motion through Peter and Paul and the disciples and all Paulus and all these different people that came in to set that church on fire. Guess what? It set the church on fire to today. 
Because here and today, the church is still on fire. So what does the church on fire look like? Johnny Erickson Tata knows what this looks like real well. She writes in one of her books, more of her biography here, and I want to just share it with you. As I told you, she, she dove into the Chesapeake Bay and broke her spine and lost the ability to use her arms and, and her legs. And, and so she, she wrote this so beautifully. Few of us have the luxury, it took me forever to think of it as that to come to ground zero with God. Before the accident, my questions always had been, how will God fit into this situation? How will he affect my dating life, my career plans, the things I enjoy? All those options were gone. It was me, just a helpless body and God. I had no other identity but God, and gradually he became enough. I became overwhelmed with the phenomenon of the personal God who created the universe living in my life. He would make me attractive and worthwhile. Whew. Maybe God's gift to me is my dependence on Him. I will never reach a place where I am self-sufficient, where God is crowded out of my life. I am aware of His grace in me every moment. My need for Him, for help, is obviously every day when I wake up flat on my back waiting for someone to come dress me. I can't even comb my own hair or blow my own nose. And there's one more thing. I have hope for the future. The Bible speaks of our bodies being glorified in heaven. In high school, that was always a hazy foreign concept. But now, I realize that I will be healed. I have not been cheated out of being a complete person. I am just going through a 40-year delay. And God is with me, even through that. Being glorified, I know the meaning of that now. It's the time after my death here when I will be on my feet dancing. <coughs> what have we done with our limitations? What have we done with what we fit God into in our own lives? What has come into the understanding of what church looks like? What my life as a follower of Jesus looks like? She put it so beautifully. The greatest gift God can give us is a dependence upon Him. What does that look like? When you and I are flat on our back and we don't know what to do. Does that come in the good times? Most often not. It's going to be in the trials. It's going to be like when I scroll through the news, I'm like, what in the world's going on? But guess what? That's not my hope. Our hope is in Christ. So for understanding for two things that the church on fire looks like, first and foremost, is hope in Jesus Christ alone. Secondly, is to share the good news at every opportunity we have. And in the meantime, waiting for those opportunities, we live it out. That's it. That's the book of Acts in, in three simple parts. But how can we take these things as a reminder of what this unsinkable spirit looks like? Remember these secrets. First and foremost is vision. Pray for, pray for vision in our lives, in our families, in our church, and in our nation. Secondly, have faith. Rest in God's compassion, hope, and love for others. It's not to rest in His compassion for me. No. 
It's not to rest in his hope in me. No. Love for me? No. All these things are to be given. Rest in those things. Have faith that he will do those things. And thirdly, to fight. Remember, this is important for us to remember. Remember that there is an eternal war going on every minute of every day. And every moment you wake up in the morning, you put on your armor of God. Because with it, we, without it, we will fail. We will fall short. The battle in his strength covered in his armor. But lastly, whew, it's my favorite part. We can rejoice. Christ has given us, the church, victory. I'm going to say that again. We can rejoice. Christ has given us victory. Yes, he has. Our theme this morning is this. An unseekable spirit dares to believe that what God says can and will be accomplished in and through us. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we recognize you in the midst of all that you're doing.